Hello. Hope you enjoy the new backdrop. It's actually not that new. I found it in the kids zone area this week and I thought, hey, I'm going to use it for a backdrop this week. Well, this week, Canadians from coast to coast have been expressing their grief and condolences after the killing of 22 people in various locations in central Nova Scotia. Most of us can hardly even begin to imagine the depths of grief and confusion and anger felt by those who have lost loved ones. Nova Scotia's premier described what happened as one of the most senseless acts of violence in that province, province's history. As I listened to one of the survivors tell his near-death experience story this week, I was, my heart just went out to him. All I could do is pray that God would heal the deep mental and emotional wounds that probably feel like they can never be healed. But we believe in a Savior who died a most brutal death and the most senseless act of violence in history. Jesus grieves with those who grieve, and he is able to provide the levels of comfort and healing that are so desperately needed now and in the days to come. As I was praying for those uh, who had experienced such agonizing loss, I, I thought of the Daniel and the horrors that he and his friends lived through when the Babylonians laid waste to the entire city of Jerusalem. Uh, the Old Testament book of Lamentations expresses the shock, confusion, horror, anger, and grief the survivors felt. A few verses from there. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow she is. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Look around and see. Is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me? The breadth and depth of the carnage and loss was total. It was something no one who survived it could ever forget. So when Daniel was reading the scroll of Jeremiah the prophet and saw Jeremiah's prediction of an end to the city's desolation, he was moved to pray an incredible prayer for its restoration. Today, we are going to pray with Daniel. So I invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 1 to 19. We're going to save the last part of the chapter, the really difficult bits. I've handed those off to Pastor Dave, and he's going to be covering those next week. Let's read Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and, and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, we and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants and the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. 
Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, Hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. At this point in time, Daniel had been living in Babylon for a long time. How long? Well, that will require doing a little math. I know some people are allergic to math, but it's important to know when Daniel prayed. That's why he tells us both the year that he was living in and the number of years that Jeremiah predicted Jerusalem's desolation would last. So, when did Daniel pray? Let's do the math. How long did Jeremiah say the exile would last, that Jerusalem would lie in ruins? 70 years. When did the exile start? Well, for Daniel, we read in chapter 1, verse 1, it started around 605 BC. When was Daniel reading the Jeremiah text? Well, it says in the first year of Darius. Now, historians express uncertainty about the identity of Darius, since we find his name in no other ancient records from this time period. Other records that we do have identify Cyrus as being the new king of Babylon when it fell. So some historians think that Daniel got his facts wrong. But I think he was probably right in that Darius was either ruling on behalf of Cyrus, like our governor general rules on behalf of Queen Elizabeth, or Darius is simply another name for Cyrus, Darius being his Persian name and Cyrus being his Babylonian throne name. Now, I think there's strong evidence for Daniel getting his facts right, which means chapter 9 takes place around 539 or 538 BC. So when we do the math, 605 minus 538, we can see why Daniel was so stirred by Jeremiah's prophecy. Daniel believed that he must be living in the last days of Jerusalem's desolation. After all, with the recent fall of the Babylonian Empire, it looked like the long years of social distancing from Jerusalem would finally be over. Now, why the timing matters it's because Ezra 1 tells us that it was in the first year of Cyrus's reign that the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus to make a major government policy change. I can't help but think that Daniel's prayer was a contributing factor to what Cyrus did, said and did in that proclamation. Ezra tells us that he issued a public proclamation encouraging the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. This was the very thing the Jewish exiles have been hoping and praying for ever since they were dragged off to Babylon 60 plus years ago. And, you know, I was thinking about that's almost the same period of time that my grandmother and her sister were separated when my grandmother left Russia as a refugee in the 1920s and her sister was left behind, behind the Iron Curtain, as they called that communism. And I remember her about in the early 80s, talking about a letter from her sister that it was possible that they might finally be allowed to reconnect. Well, the prophet Jeremiah had sent a letter to the exiles in Babylon. We actually have a copy of that letter in Jeremiah 29. And in that letter, the Lord told the people to settle down for the long haul in exile, but not to give up hope, because when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Well, as, as Daniel read that letter, he must have wondered, Lord, 
is the long desolation and separation finally coming to an end? Well, Daniel prepared himself to pray for that by fasting and dressing in sackcloth and ashes for the humbling and hard work he would be doing of representing the people before God and coming clean about what they had done that had gotten them into this mess in the first place. When we take a quick glance at the prayer as a whole, uh, we can see that most of it is confession, you'll see, in the white parts. And only petition near the end, I've underlined those parts, and, and the yellow is what he says about God. Now, all of that confession is an indication that the end of the exile could not come simply by counting down the years. No, the promised restoration, if it was going to be a full restoration and not simply, you know, a return to the old way of life that had gotten them into the mess, then they would need to admit their failures and their need to change from the inside out. You know, sometimes we put kids in time out or it feels like God puts us in a time out. And a timeout is important, but it's only productive when we use the timeout to get a new perspective and to, to come back with a new attitude and new actions. When we pray, we need to be prepared for God to change us and not just be asking God to change our circumstances. Well, Daniel's prayer itself, the main prayer, begins by addressing the Lord. You know, it's, it's worth taking notice of how we and others address God, because it often tells us not so much about who God is, but how accurate our understanding of him is. Daniel knew who he was talking to when he addressed the Lord, his God, as the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is the God who entered into his covenant of love, with his people at Mount Sinai, right after their exodus from Egypt. You know, a covenant. It's a life and death promise and commitment. The closest thing we have in our world is probably marriage vows. You know, to love, honor, and cherish until death do us part. Now, essential to a covenant are the blessings and curses that we find in the annual covenant renewal ceremony that Israel was to hold. That's outlined for us in Deuteronomy 28. And there it describes in chapter 27 and 28 that it was to take place at the town of Shechem, where Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal met, as you can see in the picture. At that annual ceremony, half the tribes were to stand on Mount Gerizim and half on Mount Ebal. The other half, one half would announce the blessings that they could expect for keeping their vows to God, and the other half would announce the curses they could expect for breaking their vows. That is primarily defeat by enemies and exile. Now, Israel's failure to keep the covenant come out clearly in Daniel's prayer and the consequences. But God also promised restoration if his people would turn from their sins and return to him. And that was the role always the prophets. Well, one of Old Testament scholars calls the prophets, they're like lawyers. They're telling them the bold print and the fine details of the agreement. Uh, I sometimes think of them as marriage counselors because they're trying to restore the relationship between God and his people. And they're saying, this is where things have gone wrong. Well, when we look at the two partners in the covenant, how does God's character come across in Daniel's prayer? Well, God, when we summarize it, it says, he's great and awesome. He's faithful, righteous, merciful and forgiving, faithful in judging, righteous in everything he does, famous for freeing his people from slavery, and a God of great mercy. Wow. So, how do the covenant, God's covenant partners, the people, come across in Daniel's prayer? Well, Daniel knew how well God's people had done in keeping their vows to love, honor, and cherish him. Not well at all. Indeed, Daniel's prayer of repentance includes the whole array of sin words used in the Old Testament. It says, we sinned. That word's often using for missing the bullseye on a target, missing the mark. We've done wrong. That word is often used when you, something has been bent or distorted or you've twisted the rules. Uh, we've been wicked. Well, that denotes the kind of life that is 
the opposite to God's character. It is used in parallel with almost every Hebrew word for sin, evil, and iniquity. It's basically criminal behavior. In fact, the next word he says, we've rebelled. The image there, a raised fist in revolt. He also says, we've turned away. We've departed. We've abandoned. We've refused to obey you, he says in, in verse 11. And the picture is, he says, we've turned, they've turned their backs to avoid listening to God's voice. And they've not listened. Not only inattentive, you know, I'm not always very attentive to what my wife or children are saying. It says, totally tuned out. They tuned out the prophets, God's lawyers, making sure that we understood what we signed on to and, and how we're doing with the bold print. Daniel knew where he and his people stood in relationship to God. Verse 7 is a good summary. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered from head to toe with shame. And he talks about everyone, near and far, in every strata of their society. The real cause of the exile, he is saying, wasn't those wicked Babylonians. You know, I would have blamed the bad guys. No. Daniel says, really, fundamentally, we are the ones, ones responsible for where we are. You know, owning up to what we have done to contribute to the problem. Oh, there may be other factors involved, and God would judge the Babylonians as well. But Daniel's point is that we've got to own up to our part. We were the main contributors to the problem. You know, and that's very sobering. But it's significant and necessary. I, uh, there's a story in Donald Miller's book, Blue Like Jazz. He tells a story from his student days at Reed College. Each year at Reed College, they had a festival for which they basically shut down the campus so that the students could party all weekend. Some of the Christians in Don's little group decided the festival would be a, a good place to come out of the closet and let everyone know that there were some Christians on campus. But how would they do that? Well, Don suggested they build a confession booth because he knew a lot of people would be doing a lot of sinning and Christian spirituality begins by confessing our sins. Now, Don actually made the suggestion as a joke, but before he could laugh at what he had said, his friend Tony caught up on it and thought it was a brilliant idea, and he began to run with it. Yeah, let's set up a confession booth in the middle of the campus, said Tony. Ah, uh, but here's the catch. We're not actually going to accept confessions. We're going to confess to them. We're going to confess that as followers of Jesus, we have not been very loving. We have been bitter. And for that, we are sorry. We will apologize for the, for the crusades, for the televangelists, for neglecting the poor and the lonely, and we will ask them to forgive us and tell them that in our selfishness, we have misrepresented Jesus on this campus. We will tell them, tell the people who come into the booth that Jesus loves them. So they did. They confessed their sins to anyone willing to listen. And Don said it was the beginning of a change for a lot of us. You know what? If things are going to improve, if there's going to be a real restoration of the church's place and role in our society and in our world, personally and corporately, then we need to be prepared to openly admit our failures and ask for forgiveness. You know, and when we ask for forgiveness, especially to God, we're able to do so because we know that the true character of the God that we are praying to, you know, it gives us hope. And that's what moves Daniel from corporate confession to petition, to asking God. And so from that foundation of confession, he asked God to show mercy to his people and carry out a great restoration. Though the plea for God's mercy follows the confession and 
could not proceed without it, it is wrong to think that confession is the basis of God's restoration. You know, the whole reason behind it. Because Daniel knows that the people, yeah, they sinned, but they're still going to sin. They're still sinful. And, and if there is any hope for them, their hope always lies with God and in his great mercy. I love that phrase. Paul in his letter, New Testament letter to the Ephesians will describe God as being rich in mercy. You know, God is rich in exactly what we need. And so, holy and righteous God, he prays, we are going to need you to carry out another great exodus. That's what Daniel is really praying. So please, turn away your righteous anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. You know, even though we were the ones that stunk up the place and ruined your reputation. Our God, we need you to listen to us. Hear our prayers and petitions even though we refuse to listen to you for so long. For your sake, restore your rep to restore your reputation in the world, a reputation we've ruined, please change the way you look at your home on earth. You know, what comes to mind in this part of Daniel's prayer is the, is the scene in the Lion King movie. You know, the part where Simba and his friends return to Simba's home. And as they look out over the once beautiful land, all they see now is how barren it has become. Timon says his famous line, uh, talk about your fixer-upper. Uh, now Simba sees that devastation too, but he sees beyond that devastation to what can take place and what can become once more, what it can become once more when right rule and righteousness is restored. Well, Daniel dreams and prays for God to restore his homeland, to restore everything that has been devastated. And God wants us to dream and pray for him to take the lead in restoring the devastated people and places in our world too. Take a moment and, and, and bring to mind the things that need God's great restoration work. You know, maybe it's relationships that have been ruined by conflict. Maybe it's bodies ravaged by disease. Maybe it's hearts devastated by loss, like those in Nova Scotia and closer to home. Now, we're going to pray about these things in a moment, along with Daniel. As we think about these devastations that we want God to do a great restoration work, it's helpful to remember, I love the quote that says, Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his willingness. So, let's pray with Daniel, the last part of his prayer. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolations that you have brought to our hearts and our minds today and that we bring before you. We can only bring ourselves to pray audacious prayers for restoration, for their restoration, because we know that your mercy is so great. So, not for our sake, but for your sake, for your reputation, Lord, for the love and longing that you have for these desolate people and places don't linger any longer. Launch your great restoration work in us and through us today. Make, the, make this moment a, a shovel-turning ceremony in the very heart of these desolate places and people. Lord, so that the world may, though, may know that you are indeed the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. Amen.